Welcome everyone, my name is Decreha and this is Europa Universalis 4 The Mandate of Heaven Expansion So this is already the 10th expansion pack for Europa Universalis 4 It's been a long road, definitely for sure This is now the 1.20 patch, nicknamed Main Patch Well, it does add a lot to China Blah. My apologies, holy crap um, <laughs> that, that just came out of nowhere. Um, adds a lot to China and East Asia in general, as well as updating a lot of mechanics to make the game completely different. Now, this being a Mandate of Heaven and focused on Asia expansion, we are going to be playing in the East. And out of all these nations, I have decided to play as Manchu. Just Manchu does not exist yet, and it's our first task as the nation of Zhenzhou to form Manchu. We already start with Manchu ideas, which is good. Well, what would also be fun is becoming the, well, reforming the Mongolian Empire, but Mongolia is not that strong. Actually, they're a vassal of Poirot at the start of the game. Anyway, Zhenzhou, we will have a few enemies at the start, eventually we'll have to deal with Japan as well. Japan has been completely changed, there's no longer a nation called Japan until it's actually formed by shoguns and daimyos. There are also many more daimyos on the map, I mean, if you look at Ashikaga, who is the current shogunate, instead of Japan being the shogunate, these are all their vassals. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 vassals. Right at the start. Um, wow. And these these are special, uh, special vassals in the sense that they don't count for their vassal limits and don't cost them diplo power. So... Um, but yeah, as Jinjiao, we will have to deal with the other tribes in the beginning, as well as Korea. I'll be playing on normal mode, because I don't want to be stuck having to restart an episode because of bugs or whatever happens, and kind of need to have save games ready for that, and you, if you're on Iron Man mode, you are just stuck with what happened, you know? So, we need some rivals. We have enemies in Yeren, Haichi, and Korea. Korea has us as a rival, Haichi has us as a rival, and Yeren has us as a rival. At least, Yeren has also rivaled, or no, Haichi has also rivaled Yeren, which is good for us. Which allows us to grab whatever we want over here quite soon. Now, there are a lot of new things. Let's first get ourselves all three of these rivals, because it's still important to have them. Now, there are quite a few mechanic updates in the game. First and foremost, it is the Aegis system, I would say, is probably one of the most important ones in the game right now. So we're currently in the Age of Discovery, and the game has been divided in four time periods. You have the Age of Discovery, the Age of Reformation, the Age of Absolutism, and the Age of Revolutions. A lot of mechanics have been tied to these ages system. The first two ages is where the religious conflicts of Europe may happen with the Protestants for, uh, rising up against the, um, well, Catholics. And beyond that, there's gonna be, um, yeah. And these will end at the end of this second age, and then we will have the Age of Absolutism, which unlocks the Absolutism mechanic. What that is, we'll get into once we reach that stage of the game. But the most important part about the Age of Ages system is you have Splendor. And Splendor is a resource you gain automatically every month, plus one. But you also gain it for having finished one of these objectives. Now, when you finish an objective, and these are the objectives for the Age of Discovery, your Splendor will increase by an additional two per month for every objective you complete. So, Discovering America, Control 5 Centers of Trade, Have a City of 30 Development, Embracing the Renaissance, and Have it in every state you have. Feudal Society, so you have to need to five different vassals. So, Ashikaga already gets that at the start, which is quite useful. As well as Ming, that's also a different system change. 
And you need to be present on two continents, and you need to humiliate rival. Rival. Once you've done, once you have 800 splendor, you're allowed to spend it on any of these abilities. And these abilities are only active for the age you get them in. This is very important. So, and there are seven of them that are available in every age for everyone. And there are four nation specific ones available in that age. And there are 16 nations that get one. And every era is basically different different four nations that get one that's when these nations were in this time period at their strongest throughout the history of the eu4 timeline so say the siege ability of the ottomans goes up dramatically portugal gets a lot more settlers denmark gets very loyal subjects and norway and sweden and venice gets a whole lot more trade power in the early game later on they lose this once they get to the next once we get to the next age Every nation loses their uh, abilities from the this age and will have to regain splendor from the beginning because you also have new objectives at that point and you lose all your splendor when the age changes. For the age of discovery there is the feudal de jure law which is the change to allow a state, state edict for minus five unrest. Now state edict is also a second big change to the game and we'll get into that in a minute. There's Justified Wars, less aggressive expansion. Transferring subjects allows to transfer the subject peace treaty at half the price. And it also allows claims bordering claims. So you can actually claim an entire country be by chaining claims beyond their borders, which is really nice. Improved war taxes, you don't pay any military points for using war taxes anymore. Cavalry to infantry ratio goes up by 20% because in the early game cavalry is the strongest and this allows you to have more. Uh, higher developed colonies, so plus one tax, production and manpower when a colony is finished. And finally adaptive combat terrain which gives you a bonus combat roll of one when you are in a terrain that is the same as your capital. So for us, our capital is in the mountains. When we get that ability, every mountain tile would get plus one for our combat so if we're attacking in the mountains we would have only a minus one penalty um technically theoretically practically one of those words anyway but if we're defending we would actually have a plus three because there's a minus two penalty from attackers in the mountains and because we have a mountain capital that is gets negated by that quite well beyond that i do need a mission and Whoa! Normally you get a starting mission to unite the Yurchin tribes and that gets you free uh, claims on um, Hingen and Jiren. But wow, it's not here for a change. Anyway, the rival of a rival would be Korchin and actually that would not be a bad starting mission for us to take. Um, they are rival to Haichi and Yiren, so they will not come into anything that would happen between us. I'm not going to ally them just yet, because I have plans of my own. I will want to focus on military in the early game to get us to that tech 4 relatively fast. At this rate it would be May uh, 1450 that we have it, which is really nice timing. We have one estate, the tribes, and what we can do here is raise a host, which is really nice. And it allows, it gets us five Eastern Swarm Cavalry for free in upfront payment. It will only take a quarter of the time to train them. And we get a general for free with 20 traditions, so we will get that going. Hopefully that will be done very soon. They're all building in Hitu Allah for some reason. Our general's at 0412, that is super strong. That's a really nice change. Now, as I said, there are now state edicts. Um, here you can see Jinjiao, which is the province, and Sao Jilin is the state. Here you can see all the state things. So the whole income for the state is 0.17, the maintenance is 0.05. And here you see the prosperity of the state, which gives you some good things. Which would give you development costs cheaper, more a lot more goods, and monthly autonomy change. Stability is positive, there's no devastation in the state, it can become a prosperous state. Now, no current edicts. There are some edicts you can do that has an effect on every province in the state. 
you can get more institution spread, more monthly autonomy down, more defensiveness, more local development costs, the local unrest reduction if you have the ability of feudal de jure law. Promote military recruitment so you get more manpower, local trade power, that's a lot of trade power, and then you have local missionary strength, plus one, or just no edict. Now, the thing is with the edicts, um, they will triple the maintenance cost of the state. So it is very important that you don't, that you watch your money while you do this. Now, that's just the start of all of this. Um, what I also want to do is go to Haichi and start spying on them. As well as a Nieren. So you have to be careful though, because I do want to declare an early war. And just for the sake of money, I will also mothball my fleet for the time being. So, um, we're, because we're currently not making any money, and we are training a lot of cavalry. So that's going to be expensive. Now, is there anything else that I need to explain right now? Not really, um, but what I can say is that there... Oh, I can show you the ideas and traditions for Manchu. Um, our traditions give us 10% land maintenance modifier reduction and land leader shock plus one. And once we finish all of them, we get another shock plus one. Then there is Unite the Three Yurchins, gets us National Manpower Increase and Core Creation Cost Goes Down. The Manchu Alphabet, which makes technology cheaper. The Eight Banners, which uh, gives us more banners, which is a system that allows us to create a specialized army that is on, that's specially for Manchu and their system of banners. There's a link with the Mongol Dynasty that gives us cavalry combat ability, manpower recovery speed with the Green Standard Army, National unrest with pigtail or death, and the Chinese laws which decrease the cost for stability. Um, I don't know exactly where we can raise banners, but we'll get the, that point very soon. I don't think we can do that just yet. This is all we're available. We are going up to force limit with uniting tribes. Change culture to Manchu. We are Manchu, so that's fine. Um, what is also really nice is the change to, where is it? Oh, you actually probably, yes, once you decide what building to click, you get a very much minimalized amount of stuff you can see. And here you will, once you have a temple available to build, you will see, you can sort by lots of things, deciding how where you want to build things, what is going to be the most beneficial one to do that in, obviously. But also very important, this expansion is the Diplomacy Macro Builder. It is really, really good. You currently have no free diplomats, so in proof relations, you can automate your diplomats to always do things. Just type of target for diplomats to automatically start improving relations with. You can do the same for alliance. Um, you can actually see here in the list who would take an alliance. Scorching would take an alliance. No one would support independence because we currently have, I think, we are independent maybe? Oh no, we can support their independent. And then we can just form join a coalition and you can also easily see who is available. Influence actions, proclaiming guarantees, sending warnings, become their tributary. We could become the tributary of Ming. They will ask us very soon anyway. Dynastic actions. We can run marry Korchin. Econ economy actions. Issue embargoes. Send gifts. Give subsidies. 110 nations would accept this at this point. And once you're papal controller or holy Roman emperor or a great power, you get even more actions here at the top. But this is so really nice. Just the improving relations for free. The, like your diplomats will automatically go once they're finished they'll go to the next nation etc it's really really in a really convenient system there's another change here the empire of china we want to become the emperor of china eventually as manchu and what it does basically it's um the empire has tributaries that will every year pay stuff to ming in this case and there are some uh, decrees that can be done that give bonuses to the empire there's also the mandate which makes it what if the higher it is the better it is for the country 
like if you have high mandate you get some bonuses if you have low mandate you get big penalties like your empire just it starts hurting a lot wow gained by having positive stability tributary states and for each state enjoying prosperity and lost by devastated provinces neighboring countries that are not tributaries now there are currently quite a few non-tributary countries next to them go to the diplomacy map mode these are the tributaries. You can see that in the north, all the hordes are not tributaries. Here in the west, some nations are not tributaries. But eventually, we want to become China ourselves. That's, of course, the first goal. But anyway, let's um, unpause and actually get started. Karchin does want an alliance. It would finish that mission a lot quicker. I will do an alliance and will not get a royal marriage with them. These guys are building cavalry, but like 300 at a time. It's really interesting. I will not take your marriage offer though. Now, first off, I do want to attack these guys. Here it is. Ming wants us to become a tributary and I will accept. Otherwise, they will just hurt us really, really badly. Like super badly. Now I think with our strong general I can already take on Haichi quite easily. So I'm actually gonna move. We've lost the take mandates of heaven from them. Man, that host is building up really quickly. There's only one more to build. It's really fast, but it's also really costly. So we're gonna need to be at war very soon to make use of them. And after the war we can remove their funding. These guys are losing attrition quite quickly. I don't know why. We are also attritioning right now. So Haichi, I'm gonna declare the war. Korchin would actually come in if we were to promise them territory. That would definitely help in the war and I actually am very happy to give them a province for their uh, thing. I cannot do that. This actually war goal is to take Jiren. We will strike immediately. Rival over rival because we're now in a war together. That gets a bonus. And Yeren goes after Buryatia. And that was their land attrition. That is actually quite nice here in the east. Um, let's shift, consolidate, drop a siege, and move onwards. We are now in charge. We're still in charge of the siege, which is fine. Whoa! Poland decided to not join with Lithuania. It's not something you see every time, or almost never. Ming is now asking different stuff from us. Unite the Yurchin tribes, this is the one we want. We well, could improve our prestige, actually, that should be possible with this war, really. I'm not gonna help them with their Tengri rebels, though. Totally not doing that. Alchukas, come on the occupation of Yanjiao. Attach a siege, everyone else can come back home. And Korchin. Oh ho ho. We lose prestige and diplomatic reputation, but Ming is attacking them. Like hell am I gonna join a war against Ming right now like that is totally not happening that is annoying let's um have enough people helping there as well you will lose some men in this fight but then again it's going to be fine what I do need yes Korchin is screwed up here you joined the siege of Yeren because that is a Two siege general that I would like to have available as well. Now, also very important in this first war is to humiliate them because they are my rival, and humiliating gives us the humiliate rival objective done, and that is quite nice to have early on for sure. Why wouldn't you just go through our own lands? That would get you less. Well, actually, there's. Because if they pass through Yer Jiren, they might actually get some problems with um, attrition going on. 
We are not at war with Ming. They will not hurt me. This will not hurt. See? They could actually unseat Jiehe for me and then run in. Yes. Wow, they are running through my lands. Well, that's the thing. I am their tributary, so that's also a reason why I wouldn't do that. And of course, they are very pissed at me now. That was an easy way to get rid of the alliance, though. Well, you're going to be pain. in pain very soon. There they are. They're getting stack wiped. So they're going to be forced to be tributary as well. The f best thing about being a tributary is the fact that you still have independent relations with other nations. So tributaries can go to war with each other and Ming cannot intervene with them. As far as I know, hopefully. But regardless, I want to thank you all for watching. Make sure to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel if you want to keep up to date in the future. I'll see you guys later.